Well, thank you to everyone for joining our session. Um, as Hannah mentioned, I coordinate PwC's education and skills practice globally, where we work with over 3,500 higher education institutions. So we, like you, are quite deeply immersed in what is undoubtedly the oddest start to any new academic year we've ever seen. My goal today is to provide you with some practical ideas around how you might want to change the way decisions are made permanently in your institutions. For sure, many crisis decision-making efforts have had to take place. But as the sector transitions into a period of continued uncertainty, what else should you change to improve resilience? If I can see the agenda slide, please. I'll start off by sharing a couple of slides from a survey we've only launched recently with higher education leaders that asked them about priorities post-COVID. It's a survey that we invite you all to respond to as well by visiting our booth so that we can continue to enrich the findings. Hopefully this will help start the debate today. I'll then ask my four panelists to speak for a few minutes on what they think needs to change and how. Each of them represents a different geography and perspective of governance and have some great advice to share. I'm talking to you today from Dubai, but my colleague Laura is in Toronto, um, and my other two colleagues, um, Ali and, um, Ma and Mike, are, are in, uh, in the UK. The session is short, and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A at the end, um, but as I mentioned, we're also um, all available for any follow-up discussions at the PwC booth. If we can go to the first slide, please. And the next slide, please. We're going, can we, yeah, so keep going forward, not backwards. There we go, thank you very much. So um, we see two groups of priorities emerging from our survey. Those on the left-hand side there that are very operationally focused in nature, um, and those on the right-hand side that are much more about the people side of running a university. But I can just speak about a few of these. Uh, risk management um, and planning for emergency scenarios, um, and in particular, some new risks such as monitoring cyber threats and other tech-based problems as, uh, as, as all these institutions have had to put access to learning online. And opening up data to researchers to work remotely and collaborate has also created um, different risk um, uh, considerations. Financial sustainability and cost containment. Um, there's been a plethora of uh, priorities that have needed to be addressed urgently here. Um, we've seen um, uh, many of our clients uh, seek advice on debt restructuring, um, applying for grants, um, looking at how to smartly stop discretionary spending, um, and in some cases, unfortunately, um, laying off younger faculty or, or those staff members that happen to have more flexible contracts. On the right hand side there, we think a little bit about the people agenda. We're seeing diversification and differentiation on a number of levels. Diversification in terms of the um, reduction in international student enrollments um, and the drive to try and expand alternative revenue sources from, um, from opportunities such as shorter courses for upskilling and reskilling the workforce. The appetite for transnational collaborations um, is, also, is also healthy and high. From a differentiation perspective, we see clients um, uh, trying to figure out how to differentiate themselves in a flooded online market um, and um, somehow um, uh, uh, get across to their students um, the idea of a unique on-campus experience. It's very, very hard to do at the moment. We see 46% of our, of our respondents looking at trying to attract more employed learners locally um, uh, rather than just focusing on, on um, uh, on, on the traditional undergraduate population and international students. So it's possibly a zero sum game if you get it right. Um, although almost, although just over 50% of our survey respondents predicted a decrease in international students, almost as many predicted an increase in domestic students. So um, there's definitely a balancing act going on. In terms of students and faculty well-being, um, this is quite varied across, across um, uh, the different markets that we support. And in some markets, this is much more, this, these issues around student and faculty well-being are much more advanced and appreciated than they are uh, perhaps in some of the, the, the more emerging markets um, and developing markets like the one I'm based in. You'll see that learning outcomes and research continuity 
are, are still pretty low down on our list of respondents. I will point out that we were asking them about short to medium term priorities. Um, so I hope that this will change once the ship is in, is in calmer seas. Next slide, please. So if we, if we consider how higher education leaders are responding to these priorities, um, we see that, uh, just, can we get to the next slide? Thank you very much. We see, not surprisingly, digital transformation way up there um, uh, to the left of the scale. And um, it's 85% uh, of our survey respondents were saying that they were going to definitely continue with blended online or even fully online in 2021. Closely following digital is um, cash management and a desire to change a uni the university to, to have more of a cost conscious culture. Um, which is, you know, not 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 something many univers not not something that all universities um, uh, are, can easily embrace. Also prevalent, um, as I previously mentioned, are activities to address student-related revenue gaps, um, whether that's from fees, whether that's from um, uh, accommodation and, and other revenue streams. Um, understanding where where potential revenue is coming from is definitely a priority for the institutions that we're working with. Access to research labs has been a priority too, um, uh, quite possibly for those institutions that are, that are trying to, to, to keep up with the medical research race um, uh, uh, related to, to the pandemic. And then we see business plan review and operational transformation down there as well, not far behind, both really important, um, but both are, are significant efforts for universities to tackle, especially if they're still caught up in crisis management. When we asked um, our respondents how long they felt it would be before COVID challenges subsided, not surprisingly, um, the overwhelming majority, 85%, said it was at least one academic year. Um, and the remainder, 25%, were unfortunately not saying less, they were saying more, um, and uh, were saying it was going to be likely three years or more. So if this is a situation we're going to be living with for at least a year and possibly longer, and we want to take advantage of the crisis in some way. This is the question that I posed our panelists. Can we have the next slide, please? So the question is the title of this session, which is how can good governance support institutions to drive change in the COVID-19 era? Our panelists will be touching on these four areas. Um, vision and leadership um, are, are, are not surprisingly um, uh, priorities for the panelists considering whether we have the right range of expertise on our board, in our executive team, to help us stay resilient and navigate the future. So you'll be hearing about them on that, um, on that point. An openness to change um, and responding to core stakeholders is another um, area of, uh, of, of concern for the panelists. Should all university strategic plans um, be immediately reshaped or reshaped as soon as possible? What other social movements um, have been accelerated by COVID-19 that we need to act on? I think that's a really interesting um, area to explore. Have our core stakeholders changed? Um, and how do we respond to that? And will we be collaborating more going forward? We've been hearing from some of the other presentations so far today about the uptick in research collaboration um, and, uh, and, and adjusting to that. And then of course, how can we do better on financial management? Do we have the right skills? How efficient are we um, at, 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 at um, handling scenario planning and agile decision making? Um, and is there something that we can potentially learn from other sectors? So on that point, um, it gives me great pleasure to ask my first panelist, um, Ali Brid and my colleague from our, who leads the um, education practice in the UK um, to say a few words. Over to you, Ali. Thanks, Ali. Thanks. Um, so, I, I was not at all surprised to see that um, financial sustainability, cost containment uh, and cash management were right up there in terms of priorities considered to be most important by global leaders right now in our survey. Here in the UK, um, the financial cliff edge has been there for a while. We've had Brexit, uh, fierce competition, increasing debt levels as institutions try to compete on the biggest and brightest campuses. And they've all been pushing the rock towards that cliff edge over the past few years. COVID-19, I think, has been the last push. And we're, and we're now 
looking over the edge and, and, and sort of trying to work out what the aftermath um, means for our financial positions for our universities. But with that, we are seeing a positive change in, in, in a swing in the focus of the executive and boards as a whole towards getting more financial grip, which I think personally is a good thing. But there is a right way and a wrong way to go about this. And the wrong choices or the wrong rollout of cost management programs can do much more damage um, when an organization's workforce is already under massive pressure, as, as is the case right now. I'd certainly not want to suggest that universities have been lax in the management of um, resources in all areas in the past, um, but certainly the pandemic has forced university leaders to have much more greater a greater level of granularity uh, of understanding about where the money comes from and where it ends up. And both executive and non-executive members of a university's leadership now need to be much more laser focused on the commercial performance of, of all parts of the business, of all parts of the university, understand and challenge where parts of the business are loss making and where there's been perhaps cost subsidisation so that they can really challenge um, how vulnerabilities within the organisation are being dealt with. And this perhaps requires a different level of analysis and perhaps a higher level of skill than perhaps has been there in the past, particularly at board level. Um, it's an important time therefore for all institutions to take stock and look at whether the mix of skills at the top of the organisation um, is right and also to lean on the skills that already exist within the board um, in, in my experience, there are often um, governors and parts of boards that, that bring a huge level of insight and experience from other industries where tight financial management has been a, a prerequisite for, for survival on an ongoing basis. So, you know, the, the ask is really for, for university leaders to make sure that they're making the most of that um, existing skill set. Um, secondly, it was, it was good to see uh, the better cash management and the importance of having a cost conscious culture. Um, are two of the ways that leaders are responding to the pandemic challenges, according to the survey. Picking up on, on cash and uh, capital optimization, first of all, um, unlike in other industries where cash is very much king, in the education sector, cash has perhaps not been given the attention it deserves. And now, for the better, over the last few months, we've seen finance departments really having to focus on basic good cash management including the development of more robust cash forecasting capacity models, stricter working capital management, talking seriously about debt covenants and what, you know, how to manage uh, the impact there. And then on um, cost, a cost conscious culture, which I definitely recognise is, 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 is something that's needed. Um, or do they have a worry about the wrong actions being taken in this context? And, and this is the area, I think, where the, there is a highest need for good governance in terms of financial management over the short term and long term. Because in the short term, many universities across the globe in the last few months have put a, put a stop and put the brakes on all non-essential spend, but perhaps without sufficient thought as to what is now essential, given the other priorities that they have to meet, a, you know, meet student experience expectations and the expectation that more time and resource might be needed on supporting the well-being of both staff and students. Um, and the discussions I've had with a number of academic and executives over the past few months have shown that putting the brakes on spend in some areas could well be a false economy further down the line. For example, as academics struggle to get hold of the right technical equipment, uh, some basic basic equipment, some are having to muddle through and um, find out other ways to be able to think about how they're going to deliver a good quality online experience in the next few weeks. So spend in some areas, I think, is now essential and, and perhaps would have been non-essential in the past. And, and that sort of um, evaluation process needs, needs to take place. That's and then great. Just, sorry, sorry Ali. Yeah. Uh, there you go on. Carry on. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I just wanted to, to make sure that we, um, we 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 got everybody everybody in at the right um, uh, uh, with their with their initial discussion. So thanks a lot, Ali. Can I now ask Jenny Dixon, who is kindly joining us from the University of Auckland? Um, uh, Jenny, um, I know you've got a background in in, uh, in, in strategic planning. Um, uh, would you like? Could you please share your thoughts? Sure, Sally. From my perspective, the, uh, the findings are just what I'd expect to see from and hear from leaders in the midst of dealing with unprecedented challenges. 
and of course thinking about how best to deal with uh, the challenges over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. But from my perspective, um, what I think the findings point to are the need, is the need to keep the big picture in mind. We're not just planning for the next uh, 12 to 24 months, but for the longer term. And uh, there's a number of things that we need to think about here. One is, of course, although in fact there are many things, but, but some I just want to quickly, quickly highlight. The role of universities, uh, our responsibilities as civic institutions, our responsibilities to our students, to our many diverse communities locally, regionally, and nationally. And the, what, what is our teaching and learning going to look like in the future? The survey highlighted, I think, the power of digital transformation. There are enormous opportunities now for how we might collaborate across universities and across the globe that we, we have not been able to before, but we can now. So wonderful opp opportunities for positioning in the future. And of course, the survey also mentioned or referred to cost management. What are our future funding streams going to look like? And we know that COVID-19 has exposed some real vulnerabilities for the university sector. So these are big challenges, um, but they're critical to address for building uh, our, our robust futures and of course, for mitigating risks. There's going to be significant change. We may not look like we did before, but what I think is critical for going forward is clear vision, strong leadership, with the right mix of skills and capacities so that, that really to help our university councils and our senior university leaders to make the best decisions that they can. Thank That's you. That's great. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thanks for sharing those perspectives. If I can now turn to my colleague, Laura, who joins us from Toronto, where I don't know, maybe the sun is rising now. <laughs> it is starting to rise, yes. There's the more light in the sky. Thanks, Sally. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you. So in North America, uh, institutional decision making has been really important uh, for responding to the impacts of COVID. And it will also be important for the secondary effects of COVID, uh, including building the permanent capabilities that we need going forward. So we're seeing a shift now from incident and crisis response to the establishment of more durable governance mechanisms. So COVID, especially in North America, but I think uh, globally has been a trigger and accelerator uh, for broader social and economic challenges is that uh, universities need to react to things like social movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, the new world of work, reskilling the unemployed. And COVID has also really accelerated the openness to change. Uh, we saw higher education put in place coordinated institution-wide responses to address operational and academic disruption due to COVID uh, for scenario planning, risk management, et cetera. So we saw a lot of inc incident response teams um, being put in place led by presidents, provosts, senior leadership, sub teams focused on business continuity and operations. Uh, we saw academic advisory groups with senior academic leaders to advise on the adjustments needed um, and strong communication for a clear flow of information across the institution. So this worked really well responding to the initial phases of the crisis with the rapid shift to online and staff and faculty working from home, etc. And now we're seeing institutions in many cases starting to build on these uh, decision-making and governance mechanisms for COVID to also respond to the secondary effects of COVID. Um, so taking advantage of what's been established to get better at forward planning and execution and shifting to a more permanent capability that we'll need going forward. So uh, digital transformation is a great example. It's been um, referred to a few times. In Canada, an estimated 8 to 10% of students don't have the resources to study online. So rethinking digital becomes an institution-wide undertaking that requires supports and, and social infrastructure that needs to be thought about on an institution basis. And we've got some great examples of institutions that are taking 
a very deliberate approach to this transformation. So we heard about the importance of vision. So revisiting and reaffirming vision to lead and inspire, making sure there's a clear view of uh, long-term purpose and the role that institutions will play. Taking a comprehensive service, des service design approach. So a very conscious approach to designing dis digital strategies to enable accessibility, uh, adopting principles of universal design for distance education across the university. Um, we've seen strength and governance to get the right engagement and decision-making clarity, um, including strong leadership alignment. So a unified commitment across the institution and consistent strategic messaging. And then roles like senior responsible officer accountable for agreed upon outcomes, design authorities to make the right decisions, advisory committees of deans who are actively participating and continuing a kind of all in this together mindset um, to really prioritize what matters. So this is, this is, you know, picking the initial projects, making sure the priorities are um, aligned with strategy. Um, and we've seen some great examples of that. One recent one was setting up um, faculty specific academies for incoming high school students delivered by high school teachers and free for all students uh, to level the playing field across a variety of faculties. So I think these examples show that universities are starting to set the big goals uh, that are needed for the future by building what on really what's already worked um, and further developing kind of their governance muscles. Um, and these approaches really set up higher education, higher education institutions to make decisions differently. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for sharing those insights. Um, if I can now um, ask Michael to uh, finish up the panel discussions and share his pearls of wisdom, over to you, Michael. We've got just about seven, well, we've got just about seven minutes left to the end of the session. So okay. uh, leave, leave room for a couple of questions for me, please. I shall be suitably focused. Thanks very much, Sally. Um, universities have never been more socially embedded, which is a great strength uh, in fulfilling their public mission. Um, so the relevance to stakeholders in the wider sense of the term has never been more vital or important. And I'm thinking here of you know, institutions being at the forefront of medical research, providing facilities for local healthcare workers, or investing in campus counselling services. So universities have both a local and global obligation to meet the expectations of the communities they serve. It was that very encouraging from the survey to see that institutions are clearly putting a high accent on student and faculty well-being. And, but I do think this is an area that all institutions need to keep um, under review. And just echoing what Ali was saying there about investing, I think this may be an area that institutions shouldn't neglect really moving forward because there could certainly be delayed responses from staff and students. You know, if this is one or three years um, uh, period of time we're looking at, you know, there could, could well be hidden wounds that need to be addressed. Uh, as a fundamental of good governance, boards have a clear uh, duty of care to the people who make up their communities, whether they're internal, external, individual, collective, academic, non-academic. So that's quite a heavy responsibility for all boards to take on board. And I think as part of that, institutions have a clear responsibility to listen to stakeholder voices. And I think that, you know, there are encouraging signs that this is happening. And Laura's reference there to academics being part of advisory groups and deans. I think this all helps uh, with boards being able to connect uh, to key stakeholders. And I think open and unambiguous communication is essential, even if, you know, especially if you have to impart bad news you know i think the trust needs to be at the, the core of institutions relationship with their stakeholders and i think that is something to be vigilant about moving forward because in you know there will inevitably be difficult times and there may be a temptation for institutions perhaps not to share as much as as they they would wish but i think you know just being open and honest and and true to the 
core values is essential. That's great. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a, a nice rounded um, way to discuss um, governance here. Um, we've got time for um, two or three questions. Um, so I'm going to um, ask Ali, first of all, there's a question come in here, um, Ali, on the, what are the successful components of a financial recovery program in your experience? Yeah, so I've talked about in my, um, in my, in my couple of minutes, I sort of mentioned about good cash management. That's, that's clearly something we see in other industries that, is, that is, has to happen from day one. But um, other things that I think are, you know, from successful programs we've seen in other industries is, is where that cost culture is shared across the leadership and much deeper within the organisation. This isn't just about the finance director. This is about engaging everybody in the need um, to manage costs and make that part of a not just a short term um, ambition, but a longer term, um, a better way of working. Um, and the ways in which you can do that, which um, we've seen work well elsewhere, are by you know, communicating much more regularly, as, as Michael's just said, about you know, with, it, with stakeholders, internal and external, about what you're doing, um, providing the right balance between challenge, grit, and positive fuel around, around successes, um, around, around cost management as well. So, so the, stick, the stick approach really works, but, but getting that sort of engagement around a cost management culture is where um, turnaround programs and cost management programs have worked really well elsewhere. Great, great, thanks Ali. Um, there's a question here for Jenny. Um, university councils think big picture, but with our countries locked down, um, they've got to be thinking about how they can remain outward looking and global. What can higher education do to keep their international character? Oh, thanks, Sally. Yes, the, um, it's, it's critical for universities, I think, going forward to maintain their international collaborations and partnerships. And that, that's, that's a great feature of universities. And it's really important, I think, for our council, for our students and our staff, that we continue to do so. We're, we're international, it's, it's in our DNA, and we'll always be international. Um, but what I think has become really, what is really highlighted is the importance of our international networks, and, and including networks like Universitas 21. And these will have even, I think, a greater role uh, in forging these post-pandemic global responses. We've already seen that a number of our key networks uh, uh, introducing some new innovations for, for staff and for students in ways that we had not previously done. So we've had a huge impetus, but I think what's going to become even more important is to actually enhance those collaborations because it's going to be, I think, even, even more important for our, 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 our teaching and our research collaborations that we can do a lot more together in terms of solving those global problems. That's not gonna go away. I think we're gonna need indeed a lot more of it. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that perspective. I've got, uh, we've got another minute left. Laura, quick one for you. Um, to what extent do you think universities will be restructuring their offerings over the next two to three years? So I think um, universities are in a really prime position to help if we think about upskilling um, with relevant, you know, high level abilities needed to address some of the key social and economic challenges that we've been discussing, close the digital divide, etc. And so there, there's a, a fantastic opportunity and I think we're starting certainly in Canada and in some cases with support from government um, as well assisting these universities to really start to move forward on some of this. So um, I know, for example, there's been a couple of instances of universities supplementing their university level courses with uh, things like language supports and foundational workplace readiness courses, employment supports, specifically for newcomers and internationally educated professionals, which is in Canada, a significant group of people. Um, and, and a group that um, has been probably inordinately impacted um, by, by COVID. We've seen micro-credentialing as well. So some new training programs to help um, job seekers reskill, um, underutilized or unemployed employees learning, for example, new manufacturing technologies, 
um, as well as things like work placement programs. So we've seen universities start to try to fill these demands um, in high demand sectors and really help people bridge the gap between current skills and needed skills. And I, I think we'll, we expect to see more of that as well. That's great. Thank you very much, panelists. Michael, I'm sorry, I've run out of time to throw a question at you. Um, uh, again, thank you so much to my panelists um, and to everybody for joining our session. Please don't forget to join us in our booth to help us enrich this survey with more responses. Um, and please everybody enjoy the rest of the summit and, and stay safe. Bye-bye from me.